Do you see my screen? We can. Yeah. You can see your screen, and then everyone is there. That's fantastic. Oh, you sent a uh, woman oh those documents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All righty. Uh, I think we uh, are ready to start. Uh, should we start, Uman? Yes, please. Okay, all right. So, uh, a good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to uh, our uh, series of talks on uh, translational biomedical engineering. Today, uh, I have a uh, great honor to have Amanda Mellon, Dr. Mellon from, uh, uh, correct me, uh, is, is that the right way of pronouncing your name, Mellon? Mellon, yeah. Mellon, no, I was right, okay. Uh, I've, I've been, it's embarrassing, I'm, I'm working no. with Amanda for a while and then I'm still having issues uh, with pronouncing her name, uh, it's my bad. Uh, so Amanda uh, uh, is uh, the CS, uh, is a co-founder of uh, uh, Upractica Pharmaceutical. I'll go over her credential and introduction, but it's a great pleasure to have uh, have you here with us, Amanda. Uh, before we start, as usual, uh, uh, we have uh, a few uh, uh, introductory uh, slides and announcements. Uh, this uh, talk will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, 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 please subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel uh, to receive uh, updated uh, uh, videos and the news about about uh, the talks. Uh, uh, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, we have uh, a question box. You can ask your questions, and uh, also you can vote uh, the questions that you uh, you might be interested in. Uh, so uh, the the this platform will bring it up, and then we can ask the questions uh, by vote. Uh, who has the who are the most popular questions? Uh, we uh, also have um, uh, a poll here uh, during the talk, uh, and we uh, uh, ask you to uh, kindly uh, uh, provide us with your feedback, and then participate in this poll. And let us know what you thought about what are your thoughts about uh, this talk and uh, these e seminar series in, in general. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, also uh, we uh, you can follow us on on Twitter and uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, we our Twitter handle is trans BME. Uh, uh, follow us on Twitter. Again, we uh, provided the most up-to-date information about these talks uh, on our Twitter, um, also on, on, on the LinkedIn as well. But this will be the our Twitter Twitter account is the one that has the most up-to-date information. You can always communicate with uh, me and Dr. Savoji uh, as the co-organizers of this e-seminar series, and uh, also uh, Bahid, uh, who is uh, the coordinator of this. Uh, series. Um, uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, thank our uh, sponsors. Without their support, uh, we couldn't run these uh, uh, e-seminar series. Uh, I'd like to thank Transmet Tech, uh, which uh, is an institute that aims to support the development of innovative medical technologies, train the next generation of professionals, and make innovations in life sciences and uh, engineering uh, a source of wealth for uh, the society um, based on a living lab approach that they're following uh, trans med tech provides an integrated environment that supports uh, interdisciplinary uh, and collaborative processes uh, and co-creation of new medical technologies and um, interventions to catalyze their development and adoption by uh, users. Uh, 
uh, you can you can uh, get more information about Transmed Tech uh, Institute uh, by uh, following their uh, Twitter account and then also LinkedIn account and also you can check their the latest update on their um, uh, activities uh, on, on the website. Uh, we also would like to uh, thank uh, the support we received from uh, 4M Biotech. Uh, it's a startup that develops uh, smart wound dressings for management of uh, slow healing wounds. Uh, you can visit their website uh, to uh, obtain more uh, uh, recent news about their activities and uh, and their work, what they're doing. So uh, with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Amanda Malone, uh, to give a talk uh, in this uh, e-seminar series. Uh, uh, Amanda is uh, graduated with high honors from Harvey Mudd uh, College in Claremont, uh, California. She's from California, beautiful California, with a degree in uh, in engineering, uh, she received her master's degree in mechanical engineering from Stanford University. Uh, so we both have uh, a degree in, in common. I'm a mechanical engineer too, uh, and then uh, uh, and also she received um, her PhD after her master's in Stanford in uh, uh, again in the same school in Stanford, but in the department of uh, uh, in bioengineering department. So. Uh, uh, Amanda is uh, the one of the co-founders of uh, Euproxia uh, Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this is a company in uh, BC, Victoria, Vancouver Island, and uh, she has uh, worked on the development of uh, drug delivery systems for almost 15 years. Uh, uh, so, Dr. Mellon has uh, worked on multiple types of uh, complex sustained release products, including. Uh, uh, parenteral injections for the treatment and prevention of a wide uh, variety of diseases, uh, intravaginal rings, releasing multiple drugs for the prevention of HIV, anti-infective films for the prevention of surgical site infections, uh, the topical cold drugs for the treatment of herpes, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So there are many, many different drugs and technologies, uh, drug delivery systems and technologies that uh, uh, Euproxia Pharmaceuticals uh, with the leadership of uh, Dr. Malone is developing and they have uh, many, many different uh, products in their pipelines uh, right now. I had a privilege to work with Euphraxia on, on one of these projects and then uh, I learned a lot personally. Uh, it's a great team to work with. Uh, Dr. Malone has uh, authored 15 publications uh, related to uh, bone function and polymer-based drug delivery systems uh, and uh, she has five patent families uh, with patents granted in, in the US, uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, other parts of the, uh, the world. She has been a principal investigator on over $11 million in grant funding from both uh, the US and Canadian governments. It's pretty impressive uh, for those who know how to, uh, who are dealing with fundraising, especially the non-dilutive fundings, uh, you know how hard it is to get this amount of uh, non-dilutive funding. It's uh, a lot of, it needs a lot of hard work and dedication and spending a lot of time uh, on preparing grants and then dealing with rejections, of course. Uh, so that can, uh, uh, I mean, uh, kudos uh, uh, and all of these. And, uh, uh, and uh, she was a National Science Foundation fellow, so NSF fellow at the US. While at Eupraxia, she has guided the scientific programs through preclinical and manufacturing development, the regulatory process in multiple jurisdictions and um, also uh, into the clinic. Uh, a lot of experience from uh, the technology development uh, side up to uh, from from the lab side, developing the technology in the lab to preclinical studies and uh, going through all these regulatory uh, approvals and clinical studies. It's uh, there's a lot of experience here that I'm, I'm sure you will we will learn a lot from her today. Uh, so prior to joining Eupraxia, Dr. Malone was the uh, VP and uh, 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 COO of a drug delivery focused biotechs, uh, Aritech. Again, I'm not pronouncing. Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so Amanda, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. It's uh, 
uh, you have had a lot of experience. It's amazing to see how uh, uh, a PhD student from a, a very prestigious school is following uh, a bit her dreams and then starting a company and then uh, uh, taking a leadership on technology development and commercialization of, of uh, different technologies uh, and then um, have like running a, a successful biotech company uh, both uh, in Canada and then in the States. Welcome uh, to, uh, to uh, our e-seminar series and then we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts about uh, uh, about the uh, transnational biomedical engineering and your experience and journey. All right. Well, thank you, Mosin. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And let me, and you gave such a good introduction. Well, let's see. They, but you told me to start my talk with uh, talking a little bit about myself. So I'm, I am going to dive a little bit more into, into me and where I came from uh, as I, as I go through this. So the topic of today's talk is diffusion-based extended release drug delivery for the treatment of arthritis. Uh, but before that, uh, Chief Scientific Officer of a small biotech, so what do I do and how did I get to be, you know, how did I get here? What 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 was my path? Uh, so we'll start with before we get to uh, what did I do or what do I do right now? How did I get here? Uh, so, uh, it started uh, way back a long time ago when I decided, when I didn't really know anything about anything, that I wanted to be a bioengineering professor when I grew up. Uh, and, you know, thought about, it, and that sounded really cool, and being a professor sounded really great, and decided, you know, that was the path I was going to follow. Uh, and so in the context of that being the path that I wanted to follow, and Growing up in California, I decided that I wanted to go to Stanford, and Stanford was the best place in the world, and beautiful, and you know, an amazing university, and and that's where I wanted to go, and and so did all the things that I that I tried to do to try and go, you know, be an undergraduate student at Stanford. But then, of course, I didn't get into Stanford as an undergrad, which is not that unusual. Most most people don't get into Stanford, but it had to kind of then take a moment uh, and reevaluate, you know, my life and what I was doing and, and think about what I wanted to do next. And so I did get into uh, Harvey Mudd, which is a, a lovely, amazing school and, and a really great uh, opportunity. Uh, Harvey Mudd is, for those who don't know it, uh, is extremely technically oriented. I think they've got six majors, um, all of them, you know, physics, computer science. So you had to be very sure that you're, you're interested in a scientific background uh, to have Harvey Mudd be, and it's very small. There's only 600 students uh, in, the whole, uh, in the whole place. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> I went to Harvey Mudd and uh, just was still, you know, committed to becoming a professor of bioengineering uh, and so thought about, okay, what, what can I do? How, you know, what's the best way to be a professor of bioengineering? And should I get a, so Tarvi Mudd, because it's so small, didn't have a bioengineering degree. So I could get a degree in engineering or I could get a degree in biology. And, and so I decided I would get a degree in, in engineering because oh, the biology would be easier to pick up along the way, but it'd be harder to pick up the engineering along the way. Uh, what you know, whatever, whether these are accurate or true, I, I actually don't think that that is accurate or true, but that is what I decided at the time. And so went through Harvey Mudd uh, and uh, did some research with a professor there on uh, corneal cells and, and how they sense mechanical strain and, and, you know, was continuing to do everything that I, that I thought that I needed to do to become a professor of bioengineering. Uh, and so when I was looking around at the world and, you know, okay, what is the next step in that path? Uh, so UCSD, uh, first of all, I was, I was very much a homer. I wanted to stay in California, but also UCSD, I think at the time was ranked second in the nation behind John Hopkins for uh, their bioengineering degree. They were, you know, kind of right at the cusp of these were, you know, this was a little bit early days for the degree of bioengineering anyway. And so uh, they were considered, you know, the best in the world for bioengineering. And so that's, I was going to go there and get my PhD and become a bioengineering professor. 
But of course, I didn't get into UCSD for, uh, for the PhD program. Uh, and so again, had to kind of retake stock in life and, and figure out what it was that, uh, you know, okay, what is it that I want to do? And, and, you know, but no, I'm still committed. I still want to be a professor of bioengineering. And so looking around at my other options, and I actually did get into Stanford this time. Uh, so, uh, and actually a, a professor there because of the work that I had done as an undergrad when I was putting that application together, he was doing work on bone cells and how bone cells sense mechanical uh, loads. So, you know, he saw that connection and reached out to me uh, if I wanted to work with, you know, in his lab uh, at Stanford. And so, uh, you know, looked around at a bunch of schools, but but ultimately decided to to go to Stanford uh, and, and get my PhD there. Uh, and so, uh, I got my PhD in mechanotransduction mechanisms in bone cells. And so what is that? But I mean, pretty much what that means uh, is the cells in your bones can tell whether or not they're, you're using them. So they're, you, can, you're, you can tell whether or not they're being loaded. And uh, there's lots of speculation about the different cellular mechanisms uh, behind whether or not, like how your cells can tell that you're using them. The lab that I worked with was very interested in the sensing of fluid movement across cells. They felt like that was one of the, the significant mechanosensors. And so I did some research on primary cilia, which are considered a vestigial organelle up till recently, but then have been implemented in polycystic kidney disease. And anyway, it, there was, possible, I mean, so the, the work that I published uh, out of my PhD was, was looking at primary cilia as, uh, as mechanosensing organelles in bone cells. So while I was getting my PhD, I met a lovely Canadian also getting his PhD at Stanford in uh, uh, aeronautical engineering, astronautical engineering. Uh, so we got married. We, we finished our PhDs, and so by the time I finished my PhD, the only thing that I was 100% certain of was that I no longer wanted to be a professor of bioengineering. Um, I had kind of, uh, after being, ex I, what resonated with me about bioengineering was the ability to try and help people. and. I guess it and different areas of research uh, for bioengineering are have different levels of are, are different. But I guess for me, my PhD felt too far away from actually being something that would actually make a difference in people's lives. So you know, we I discovered a way that bone cells sense mechanical load, and then maybe you know it would take some number of you know, five years, 10 years to like, then find a target to impact the mechanism that I found. And then another 10 years plus to actually turn that mechanism into a potential drug and get that drug approved. So, you know, maybe work that I did during my PhD, maybe 20 years down the road might be actually having a concrete impact in people's lives. And for me, that was a little too, uh, not, it wasn't concrete enough. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. I wasn't feeling like it was actually making a difference in a, the near term uh, um, in people's lives. So I got to the end. I knew I didn't want to do the thing that I had, you know, spent my life planning and, and working towards. But I didn't know what it was that I was that I did want to do. Uh, so we, my husband and I, um, the two body problem. We had two PhDs, both looking for work and we moved down to Southern California so he could work at Jet Propulsion Labs uh, down in Pasadena. And I was from Southern California originally, so I looked around it and I actually connected with a, um, a doctor who was kind of starting or had started but was still very small, a, uh, a, a biotech company called Oratech Pharmaceuticals. And he was doing, um, different kinds of 
of sustained release drug delivery. Uh, and in my interview with him, I sat down and I was said, you know, this sounds really amazing. I'm really excited about all the things that you're doing, but I have absolutely no idea about the pharmaceutical industry. I have absolutely no idea about, you know, sustained release drug delivery. And he was like, that's okay. Where, you know, like I do, because uh, he had already, you know, successfully founded a, a few companies in the past and actually had FDA approved products. He said, I'm happy to teach you. And so I, I started working uh, at Ortec Pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then we, uh, during that time, spun out a company called O-Ray Pharmaceuticals that was working on similar technology as Ortec, uh, but specifically for indications in the ear. Uh, and then uh, kind of midway, uh, I'd, after I'd been working at Ortec for a few years, uh, my husband and I moved back to Canada because that's where we wanted to raise um, our, our children. And we, um, I connected with an old friend who, uh, James Hollywell, who was a, an MD who worked uh, out of Vancouver. He was uh, an anesthesiologist uh, that essentially ran the anesthesiology department out of St. Paul's in Vancouver and, and was doing all these super complicated heart transplants and was really kind of at the top of his field, but was was looking for something uh, other than being kind of just a doc, you know, uh, I guess in a way similar to me, uh, when the doctor, you make a huge impact with on one person each time, but was kind of looking for a way, what, what can I do to make a, an impact on more people's lives? Like how can I step back and make a broader impact? And so talk to him about, uh, he was thinking about starting uh, Eupraxia. And so, uh, I was still working with Oratech, but Oratech had some technology that uh, was interesting that, that you practically felt like maybe we could utilize that technology and then expand it. Because uh, Oratech Pharmaceuticals was very, very good at the early stage research, doing lots of very early discovery, but they didn't really have the resources or the desire to take products further, like all of the things that you need to do to actually get a product approved and in people. And so it seemed like a, a, a good synergy between the two companies. And so for a while I worked for both uh, Ortec Pharmaceuticals and Eupraxia, uh, and then just transitioned to being uh, working solely at Eupraxia. So Eupraxia took that initial technology and then developed a bunch more technology and a bunch more patents surrounding uh, Eupraxia's platform. So then, as Eupraxia has grown, we've also spun out a medical device company uh, that that uh, was out of an idea that came out of trying to more accurately uh, make sure that, that people, because uh, more accurately, sorry, one second, I'm opening a can. All right. To ensure that people are injecting accurately into knee joints. Uh, and then that company uh, grew, developed their product, actually sold their product to a company in Israel. And then the uh, core group of that company has founded a new medical device company called GuideStar Medical Devices to work on epidural injections. Um, so it is interesting to kind of see the, I mean, I, I do think that there is uh, the, the community of, of small biotechs do tend to, to produce more biotechs and, and kind of grow in that way, which is also really interesting. So, all right. What do I do with Eupraxia Pharmaceuticals? Or more, I think, because I pretty much am in charge of all of the science, I, I, I'm going to move it more to what does Eupraxia do? Uh, and uh, and then we can kind of look a little bit if you guys are interested in in my role in, in what Eupraxia does. So Eupraxia Pharmaceuticals, we are a clinical stage sustained release drug delivery company. Uh, and really the goals of our technology are to improve efficacy and safety uh, of all of our products. Uh, and with those improvements in efficacy and safety really drive market growth opportunities. And we really see our technology as a multiple application platform. We see ourselves as being very flexible and able to work in, in a large range of indications. So why are we special? What, what is the difference? So when you look at kind of standard drug release, what you get is a, is a to dose 
a patient, you need to cover the, the, the drug needs to be efficacious for a certain, like a long enough period of time to make a dosing regime that's reasonable for the patient. So it is an unrealistic expectation to expect people to be taking pills every two hours or, uh, you know, doing like, uh, there's lots of studies that show, you know, the number of times you ask someone to, to dose a drug compliance is inversely, inversely related to how much effort you're asking the people to put in. So to increase duration, what people usually do is they increase the dose because they say, okay, the long, the more drug we give that you will spend a longer period of time uh, above therapeutic levels. But what that means is that you're giving a huge amount of drug to, and you're, as the drug hits the system really fast, you're getting this very dramatic spike, the Cmax in drug concentrations to enable that extended, like to enable that you're not dosing the drug as often. Uh, and when you look at what causes side effects in drugs, the vast majority of all side effects are actually caused by that Cmax, that that initial burst of drug that, that is kind of wasted drug. It's drug above uh, what what is necessary to actually get a therapeutic effect. And so what our technology focuses on is blunting that Cmax and flattening the tail uh, of our products. So you're getting much less wasted drug. All of the drug that you're putting into the system is drug that's useful. It's it's above therapeutic, but it's not contributing to toxicity, essentially. And so how do we do that? We actually have a diffusion-based system. So um, what I like to think about is we have, our product is actually a, a bunch of little mini implants, if you, if you want to look at it that way. So they're essentially, it's a solid core of drug surrounded by a thin membrane of polymer. And uh, dif the diffusion-based system is you get uh, fluid, inter intercellular fluid or interstitial fluid, diffuses across the membrane of the polymer and creates a saturated solution inside of these little, um, you know, sustained release delivery particles. And since you have essentially sink conditions outside of the membrane, you get a constant drive of, dif of drug Diffuse, diffusing across that membrane. And so what that does is it limits the amount of drug. So you, because you're always getting that, essentially the, uh, the constant delta across the membrane, you get a relatively steady release of drug for the entire duration of treatment. And so how do we impact, you know, what do we do to, because I said we have a broad platform. So how do we impact that technology? And so what, what we do when we're thinking about a new drug or a new indication, you, you want to go in and you look and you say, okay, what is the desired dosing regime at, and okay, how potent is this drug? And, you know, how, to, how toxic is this drug? And that gives you the parameters that you need to kind of look at and say, okay, to dose this drug the way I want to dose it, I want to stay above X, I don't want to go above Y, and I want it to last you know, a week or a month or six months or a year. And you can put those kind of calculations in and, and figure out how much you need to control the release of the drug. And then <clears throat> once we have that determined, then we can go in and look at our different levers we have for controlling the release of, of the drug. And so, we look at particle size. Uh, so if you think about um, a an ice cube melts faster than an iceberg. And so we like to decrease our surface to volume ratio as much as possible to slow the release of drug uh, in our systems. Uh, we are able to think about which types of polymers we pick. Uh, so we like to look at polymers that are already approved by the FDA, our known polymers, but, but we can kind of pair, you can look at if you've got a hydrophilic drug, you can look at a hydrophobic polymer. So, so we kind of think about what type of polymer is going to make the difference for imp impacting that type of drug's release. Then you can put, uh, you again, 
once you have those, then you can further tweak the release by looking at how much polymer you put onto the drug and how much you cross-link that polymer, where the cross-linking essentially will slow the, will modulate the diffusion of the drug across that membrane and will also impact how long the membrane lasts before it, it degrades in the body. So just some pictures on the on the right, looking at our different types of technologies. So uh, our, we have the, the top left is showing kind of the thin polymer membrane we have on different crystals. We've got the SCM of the, the completed, um, the coated particles. And then in the bottom, uh, just some cool pictures looking at uh, partially dissolved uh, particles. Uh, the point being that unlike a lot of technologies, which I'll compare on the next slide, the, the particle doesn't break down as it's releasing. It actually does release the drug across the membrane for the duration uh, of, of the intended use. All right, so how do these condition, like how do these effects add? So if you look, so this is both in vitro, so in a dissolution bath, and in vivo, uh, looking at the additive effects of our technology. So the blue lines are uh, just micronized powder of, of the drug. So you can see for both of those in the in vitro system, they dissolve very quickly and get to essentially 100% of the drug is dissolved, you know, within a couple hours. Uh, when you mirror that over into the onto the in vivo side, you get a, you know, that results in a very high Cmax and a rapid drop off of drug. When you do the first step of our technology and create large crystals, that's the green lines, you can see that that has a dramatic slowing of the release, uh, both in vitro, and that results in a, in a lowering of the Cmax by about a half log unit in vivo. And it does flatten the tail of the drug release somewhat, uh, but still it has a, you know, a very logarithmic curve uh, to the release. And then when you put our coating on top, of the the large crystals, you again you see the dramatic reduction of Cmax and the flattening of the tail. So, how do we compare to other sustained release drug delivery technologies? Because lots of people understand, you know, it's better to dose drugs less often, and Cmax is bad. So, other people are trying to tackle this problem. So most people, when you talk about um, polymer-based drug delivery systems, are using coacervation-based technologies. Uh, and that's, coacervation is you're essentially mixing the drug and the polymer together into droplets, and then those droplets are, you know, sprayed out, and you get a, a kind of a, a chocolate chip cookie, if you will, of, of drug and polymer, where the drug or the chocolate chip cookies and the polymer is the dough. And one of the significant advantages we feel of our technology over conventional uh, drug deli delivery technology is when you look at our particles, we have over 90% drug, less than 10% polymer because we just have that thin membrane um, around the, the crystals. But when you look at a uh, standard coacervated based technology, they are typically 80% plus of polymer and less than 20% of drugs. So uh, one of our main competitors uh, for our lead product, you know, we've got 1.5 milligrams of polymer in our dose and they've got 132 milligrams of polymer in that in their uh, essentially equivalent dose. And one of the reasons that matters is all that polymer has to be processed by the body over time. So we are, you know, two orders of magnitude of less of a potentially toxic, uh, depending on what type of polymers you're using, but a much less polymer that needs to be processed by the body. So <clears throat> we have this super broad technology that can be used for you know any number of indications. Which one do you pick first? Uh, and because with a small biotech, you typically get you know, you get one shot to really prove your technology to people. And then if you've proven it, then you can expand it and they will, you know, are more likely to support you for, for other technologies. And, and so when we looked around at, at all the different markets and all the different places where we, we could work, uh, we 
we looked at OA and, and we really saw osteoarthritis as a huge unmet medical need. Uh, I mean, it affects, you know, as the world population ages, it's going to be affecting more and more of us. Uh, you know, uh, we are as a society being more active longer, uh, which also has an impact on osteoarthritis. Um, historically, OA has been considered a wear and tear disease, but you know, as the as the science behind OA has evolved, it, it really uh, is pointing to that it actually is an inflammatory disease, and it's the inflammatory mediators caused uh, that develop a feedback cycle that really lead to the breakdown of the cartilage in the joint and, and lead to the progression of OA. So uh, the American College of, of Rheumatology uh, puts out um, guidelines for their phys physicians kind of once every seven to, to nine years. And uh, this is the, the guidance that the doctors are across the US look to when they're treating their patients for osteoarthritis. And so there was uh, the 2019 ACR guidelines came out actually right at the beginning of 2020. And it, it was interesting because they came out strongly against a, a bunch of technologies that, that lots of companies have been working on recently. Uh, so, and for those of you who've had hurt knees, I mean, you may have heard of PRP, so uh, our stem cell injections. Um, you know, lots of people have been looking at TNF alpha inhibitors uh, and, and pretty much came out against all of these kind of newer technologies saying that either that they weren't effective or that their uh, the side effect profiles that they were showing were not worth the, you know, whatever efficacy it was that, that they might be demonstrating. So the things that they came out and said that they were for were oral NSAIDs and intraarticular injections of steroids, uh, which is, very convenient for us and, and really great for us because we have actually been working on an intraarticular injection of a steroid for the past seven years. So really keen to, to play with that. Yes, this was something that, uh, and we can talk, I will talk a little bit about why, but that we were kind of right in what the, um, the guidelines uh, are, are recommending that doctors are, are using for the treatment of osteoarthritis. And so when we think about what is the, what we want is the gold standard for the treatment of arthritis. What we want is a drug that will stop the inflammation cycle. So, so stop the break, the continued propagation of getting, of making the disease worse. But what we don't want that drug to do is cause cartilage damage as well, because then you're defeating the purpose of of what you're, you know, you're, you're then exas as you're treating the disease, you're also exacerbating the disease. And so there are people working for, um, to make drugs, but very few of them have been, like what, what hasn't been, what no one has been able to do successfully is create a drug that reduces the pain of OA but also does not have a negative impact on the cartilage of OA. So there are groups that are trying to uh, be disease modifying and that they're trying to grow cartilage, uh, which is really exciting, except when you look at the pain scores from essentially all of the drugs in those trials, they're not actually having an impact on any of the people's pain relief for osteoarthritis. And so whether that means they're not growing cartilage in the right place, or whether you know they're not disrupting the inflammatory cycle. Uh, so they're getting cartilage growth, but they're not treating the pain. And then there are other drugs. Uh, so Zilretta is a sustained release steroid. It's been approved for about a year and a half um, that does treat the pain of arthritis for about three months. So when you, the, a standard intraarticular injection of steroid but prior to Zoretta would last about one month, but the side effects were such that you could only give it once every three months. So there would be about two months in which that those patients did
did were not didn't have pain relief, but they couldn't go back and get another injection due to safety concerns. So Zoretta lasts three months, but in all of their preclinical data, they actually showed that they, uh, and I have that data later, they, they show that they actually cause cartilage damage. And so the FDA has not been supportive of Zoretta being dosed more than once in a patient's knee. And then there's other companies, uh, you know, really big companies like Novartis doing, or, and uh, Pfizer doing work on monoclonal antibodies uh, for pain relief for osteoarthritis. But then those drugs have actually, sh have actually shown that there's like about two and a half percent uh, rate of very serious uh, side effects of osteonecrosis and rapidly progressing away. So for some people, they're doing a good job treating pain in the knee, but for others, they're actually causing very rapid, uh, you know, degrade degeneration uh, of those joints. So how are we different? So we are a steroid. So we are a drug that people uh, know and are comfortable with in the treatment of arthritis. Uh, the steroid that we are using is actually flutigazone propionate and it has never been used in the joint before. It's been used to treat uh, asthma for decades, but it, uh, we will be the first people to ever use it in the joint. But it's a very well understood mechanism. It's a very safe and well understood drug. So we are using a steroid, but unlike anybody in the past, who has used a steroid in the joint, we are completely cartilage sparing. So, uh, and that is a game changer in the treatment of arthritis because we're actually providing the pain relief, but not the side effects that all of the other drugs that actually had the pain relief were uh, unfortunately had those side effects. So we are an extended relief, um, so we believe that we are gonna last six months. Uh, so the current best uh, treatment on the market lasts three months. And because we have, uh, because we are so safe, both locally and systemically, we believe we will be um, able to be repeat dosed and uh, be able to be dosed in multiple joints uh, simultaneously. Because 70% of the people who have, suffer from OA have more than one affected joint. So currently right now, what you have to do is you have to pick which joint uh, is the one that's bothering you less, and that's the one that the doctor will dose. So safety, uh, we when we compare ourselves to uh, the Zoretta, which is the one that uh, the sustained release steroid that was just approved in the market, and immediate release uh, steroids that are out in the market, uh, there's this thing that people look at called Mencken scores, which are a of scale of uh, looking at your cartilage health in your joints, uh, sorry, in animals. So, so because we can't actually take histology of people's knees when they're in the clinic. So, uh, but it looks at a number, like a scale of all different tide mark integrity and proteoglycans and kind of gets us some of the cartilage health. And so, the steroids that are out there are improved actually cause cartilage damage beyond the time of which they cause pain relief. So, you know, immediate release steroids relieve pain for, uh, you know, one month, but cause damage out to six months. You know, flexions causes, you know, has pain relief out to three months, but has damage out at nine months. So in our studies at all doses, at all time points, we cause no damage to those joints uh, at any time point. And why is that? Uh, and that really, uh, we believe, has very much to do with our ability to reduce the CMAX. We feel like the mitigate our technology, which mitigates the CMAX and re produces that very flat, steady release, uh, is the difference in in why we cause we do not cause cartilage damage. While those other um, because steroids are, I mean, a lot of these are probably class effects. So it, it's you know, there's nothing special about flutigazone per se but it's our ability to release fluticasone in a, in a slow, steady way that, that really makes the difference. We did a phase one clinical study uh, in three sites in Canada, very small study, and we looked at mostly safety, pharmacokinetics, and we did a little bit of um, looking at efficacy. Uh, 
And what we saw in our, so this was a, a preliminary dose. Uh, we are intending to dose escalate in future work, but in this early dose study that our pain relief uh, was greater uh, than Zoretta, as it, which is an already approved product and lasts longer. And so we think that uh, with, uh, and we are approved from our next, uh, with our study that we're gonna do next, to actually dose escalate from here and double the dose. And so uh, with looking to the future, we think we're gonna have a really great package of really great pain relief, very a very safe product and the ability to dose twice a year, which we think that will really line up with patients, uh, what they want and what the doctors want to, to see. Uh, but with any small study, all, you know, you guys are all scientists, there's, you know, real data is tricky. So we only had eight placebo patients in this early trial. And when you look at, so uh, the circles are our active group, the, the sorry, the, the light green circles, the kind of yellow, muddy yellow circles are our placebo group. And then the the also muddy green squares are kind of what you would think of as a standard placebo uh, group when you when you have kind of over 50 or over 60 patients in a trial. So as you can see, we had an, an outsized effect uh, from a few of our placebo patients who uh, got better over time, whether it was a <clears throat> regression to the mean and that you go into a clinical trial when your knee is hurting and it gets better over time, it happens. Uh, but those patients did kind of have an outsized effect on our placebo. So in future studies, we're going to have much more than eight placebo patients, and we hope to not see that same type of curve uh, going forward. But still, even with that curve, we did have sustained pain relief over placebo out past 12 weeks uh, in that early study. Or two 12 weeks. Anyway, so systemic safety comparing ourselves to uh, to Zoretta and to immediate release steroids. Uh, so when you think about systemic safety for a steroid, what you're talking about is whether or not you're suppressing the body's ability to make its own hormones, its own cortisol. Uh, and so uh, it's okay to uh, have a short-term disruption to the body's ability, like to make cortisol, but if you do it for a longer period of time, then that really interferes with the body's stress response. So if you got in a car accident or needed to go into surgery, your body wouldn't be able to actually produce the the, horm the steroids it needs to, to create a stress response. And so when you look at immediate release transit alone, you see a very large drop in the body's serum cortisol levels, but they bounce back quickly and return to normal. Uh, Zoretta, on the other hand, has a kind of a prolonged uh, 30, you know, 50 to 30, and then moving to 30% cortisol suppression. Uh, and this really limits their ability to dose multiple joints because uh, cortisol works kind of on an S-shaped curve. So when you get on the steep part of the curve, a little bit more drug can cause a lot more uh, suppression of your body's ability to make cortisol. Uh, compared to us, we have a, you know, Day two, slight drop in serum cortisol, but we're always well within normal ranges. And essentially after by week one back and not no changes at all. So looking to the future, I mean, what are we doing right now? We are on our way to um, getting uh, COVID through a little bit of a monkey wrench uh, into the process, but we are about to start a phase two trial with uh, 120 patients per arm, uh, looking at a dose doubled what we did in our phase one. We're gonna look at all the kind of standard endpoints that people um, look at in an osteoarthritis trial, um, lots of pain, but also function, quality of life, um, daily activity levels, and, and really track people over a six month period and feel like we'll get a really good sense of how our drug is performing. Uh, and, and this, will have the potential to be one of our pivotal trials for approval with, by the FDA. So uh, also, what have we been doing? Or what have I been doing over the last period of time? There's also, there's the, the preclinical and the clinical side, but there's also the manufacturing side. 
uh, which you, is really important for the small biotech. One of the main failings of small biotechs is they lack, because manufacturing is expensive, you can kind of put that in the back burner and have that lag. And then when you go to partner with someone in the future, they will grind you on valuation because your, your manufacturing is not ready to go for phase three and commercial. Uh, so we've <clears throat> done a lot of work uh, developing our manufacturing process. Uh, it's, we use very kind of standard pharmaceutical equipment, but we kind of use it in ways that people uh, don't typically do. Uh, like our particles are really small. We coat them in a uh, fluid, fluid bed coater, a Worcester coater, which is typically used, they're you know, a couple stories tall and they, they coat Advil tablets. Uh, so people are very comfortable with coating particles of that size. Uh, pretty much nobody in the world can coat particles down to the, you know, under, uh, you know, sub 100 micron size particles, which is kind of the sweet spot where we play. Uh, and so we have um, technology, trade secrets and patents kind of around some of the, the aspects of our technology where we're using techniques and equipment that are standard for the industry, but in ways that people don't expect. Uh, so one of the things that everybody wants to see when you're, when you're talking to people about, you know, how is your manufacturing process going is, is it a reproducible process? Is it a reliable process? And we've, we're actually at commercial launch scale right now uh, with our product and can demonstrate that we can make it reliably, um, with a lot of consistency. So that, that's very important when you're trying to partner your, your product with, you know, other companies or trying to just, um, you know, when you're talking to investors about where where you are uh, in your development process. <clears throat> we do have IP um, granted and pending uh, on the, the technology, both on the, how we make, you know, like the composition of the particles and also um, different steps of the manufacturing process and, and how those get put together. Um, and, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, our lead product is in osteoarthritis, but there's lots of potential for all different types of indications. Uh, we, uh, we've worked with Mosin on anti-infectives that I think are really exciting. Uh, we've done some work in local pain relief. Pretty much all of our products can have potential use in veterinary applications. We've, got, we've had definitely interest in large vet companies to partner with us to license our technology for, for vet applications. Um, yeah, and, it, it's, and I think when you have a really flexible technology, picking which uh, indications to go for, it becomes uh, you know, very important and very challenging because there are um, the balance between you know, how many players are in the market and how, you know, or what, like how, how you can actually, what's your value add? Um, you know, there, there's lots, there's lots of science and art that goes into thinking about what, what the right places are, you know, to, to focus energy and attention. All right. So in the whole course of my career, I've also collected a number of creatures, including two children and a dog and a cat. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about being a chief scientific officer or you practice technology or just being a mom, you know, working, whatever it is that anybody's interested in. I'm happy, happy to answer questions on, on any anything that works. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, for sharing your story. Yeah. It was really interesting uh, how, how you came along this long way uh, from academia to, to industry, and you kind of uh, invented and also built up this company from the scratch. So yeah, so before going to, to, to Q&A section, I just want to uh, announce some, uh, uh, some uh, announcement here, if I can. Yes. Yes. Uh, so again, we would like to thank the Transmit Tech uh, Institute for providing us uh, the support, and also for Embiotech uh, uh, that uh, provides support to to have this e seminar. Uh, 
our next speaker same time uh, same place next Wednesday uh, is uh, Dr. Andrew Lee, uh, head of bioprinting and co-founder at Fluid Form. Uh, he will talk about fresh 3D bioprinting for functional tissue engineering. Uh, I encourage everybody to attend this seminar because uh, Andrew is a great scientist who graduated from uh, Cornell University and he founded this company right away after his graduation. Uh, so let's uh, get to, to the Q&A box. Uh, we got some question here. Uh, uh, the first question from Brent, uh, I think from University of Victoria and 4M Biotech. Uh, can you please comment on the grant resources available to STEM biotech, a small biotech companies in setting up and ex executing early stage clinical trials in Canada or the US? How about the team staffing required to execute such a study? All right, there's lots of lots in there. I will see how I can do. So um, there are. I, so if you're based in Victoria, I'm guessing that you're a Canadian-based company. So I will answer like like that. Uh, but obviously, it's different for different places. So Canada has a lot of really good grants for companies that are just getting started. There's the IRAP program, uh, which uh, is a really, um, they start with, um, they like to give kind of small grants at the beginning to learn to, about your company and then like the size of the grants go over time. Um, they're also, they have lots of, I mean, Mosin and I partnered with a MyTax grant. So if you have a, a connection with a, a university collaborator, there's a lot of great opportunities to um, have a person working in an uh, academics lab and then working on a project for your company with the kind of advice and guidance of the professor. Um, and those, the turnaround of those is typically really fast. So the, the US government um, has a whole different set of grants for small businesses. Those are called SBIR grants. Uh, and those, unfortunately for a Canadian based company, you need to actually be an American-based company to be eligible for those grants. But you do have the option uh, as a Canadian-based company to apply for, they're called R1s and R21s. Those are just research-based grants, but it, for those grants, you're competing with all of the academics. Uh, in, and so there, that is a more competitive grant mechanism than the ones uh, for the small businesses. And also the, the Canadian grants typically are much smaller amounts but they tend to give them out to, to a larger number of companies. I think that I mean, the success rate for US grants is less than 10%. I would say like the grant rate for Canada, I don't know what it is, but I would think that it's probably upwards for the small business grants, upwards of 50%. Um, but that's totally me guessing on that. I don't actually know what that is. As far as the personnel needs, um, there's a lot of different models for biotech. And I think that a lot of companies now, uh, and something that's really great is that you can start really virtual. So you can start without too much internal resource. So Upraxia was very small for a significant period of time. So we were, I mean, essentially it was, it was me and we had a lab scientist who was working at um, like, kind of renting bench space at Simon Fraser and UBC at, at CDRD at the um, control. Anyway, so it was finding what kind of, so I was doing all of the preclinical and clinical, and I was doing that and the manufacturing, but I was doing that by like, we had a manufacturing facility that, that was new about the type of technology that we were working with. And so I'm utilizing their personnel for that work. And then for the preclinical, I'm not doing the, the animal studies myself. I'm outsourcing that to a research lab that has the, you know, the animal approval boards and the ability to house the animals and has done those type of studies before. And then when we ran the clinical study, by then we were a little bit bigger, but it still was, we were very small. And you're hiring a CRO that, um, that knows how to manage clinical studies. So they've got the the monitors of the studies and they're building the 
the database to keep track of the data and everything like that. So you can start and have a, and run with very little actual internal sort resources. But then at some point, you get a little bit bigger and you realize that it's more efficient to actually have do you bring the brains in house as much as you can, and then you still have those companies working for you, but but to more of an extent, you are doing more of the work, and so you can really balance balance that over time. So now, Upraxia has, I mean, we have a VP of clinical science, we have a somebody in charge of manufacturing, we've got someone in charge of regulatory and QA, we've got a, you know a, an internal um, a math pharmacometric statistician, and we've got a translational scientist who's you know, is in charge of the preclinical and all of them feed up through me. So because we grew enough that, and they have more in-depth expertise than I do in any of those one topics. So for a while you can get by with the help of the external people. And then at some point you realize like, as you're growing, it becomes more advantageous to bring it in-house. It's a long answer to your question. Sorry oh, that. Thank you very much. It's a great answer. I think he has a follow-up question that you partially answered, but I will read it. Does using common manufacturing technology in different ways limit you to conducting the manufacturing in-house at this stage of your company? Have you considered outsourcing the manufacturing? So we do, we outsource pretty much everything. So, but because we are doing kind of things that people aren't exactly expertise experts in we don't our, all of our manufacturing isn't at one place so we have a group that is really good at for one part of our technology but they didn't know how to do a different part and then so we transfer the the kind of an intermediate drug product from one to another and then a different group finishes it for us because they had different levels of expertise so in the future we probably would consolidate that all we would pick we still would probably do it externally because of all of the processes and controls that you need for a commercial based product and all the audits and everything. It probably doesn't make sense for us to have that as an internal capability, but we would consolidate it at one place and train one group. So essentially it's our manufacturing facility, but it's housed in someone else's functioning um, manufacturing organization. Thank you so much. If you look at the chat box, uh, Brent, thank you for, for your answer. So, <laughs> Mohsen has a question. Please go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I wanted to uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, so so uh, uh, well, thank you very much. Very inspiring talk and then very interesting uh presentation uh starting from from the beginning and then uh, i mean i mean nice photos uh, of your childhood <laughs> uh so uh but the question that i'm going to ask is mostly about your personal life you showed that you have two kids and then you have family here and then uh, you have a lot of responsibilities as well uh, so how do you balance your personal life with uh, all these responsibilities? I want to learn because <laughs> I, I have a uh, three-year-old daughter. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. So uh, it's, it's, it's great to get some advice mm -hmm. from you and probably some, uh, many, many others uh, have the same question. Yeah, well, I think first, I think you have to give yourself a lot of grace and forgiveness, right? So I, some, I read somewhere, I don't, I mean, but there's like a, there's a triangle, right? And so there's your work and there's your kid, like life, personal life, kids, activities, whatever. And then there's your house. And only you can only two parts of the triangle will ever be under control at any one time. You can't actually. And so my house is, oh God, you know, like my house is a mess. Uh, but I do think that one of the great things about being in small biotech is that you do have the ability to create for yourself a flexible way of working. Like I, uh, and I guess because I've been, uh, pretty much my entire time that I have been growing these companies, I've also been growing my family. And so it was really important always for me culturally for the companies to promote that work-life balance such that, you know, it's about getting the work done. It's not about putting in the nine to five or, you know, whatever the chunk of time is that 
that you need to, to, to get the job done. So it, you know, like it was always really important for me in the growing of these companies to make sure that, you know, if I wanted to go to the kindergarten show, I would, you know, leave and go to the kindergarten show. Cause that, you know, that was something that I wanted to do. So I do think if I had, like my sister come, like she's a lawyer and her husband's a lawyer and that's very rigid and long. And I don't know, I don't know how they do it. Like that's, and I mean, they have a nanny and that's, I guess that's how they do it. But that is a very, to me, the being able to be flexible in my work is something that has made it possible and enjoyable. And sometimes they're crazier than others. You know, sometimes you're working on something at 10 or 11 p.m. at night because that's the time that you had to do it. Um, but uh, it is, it's crazy. It's nuts. Like there's, it is, it's just a, you know, there's no, and, and I do think, because your kids are younger than mine, Moses, and I do think that there's like this, you get, there's a chunk of time when there really is no space for anything but your work and your children. Like there's no sense of identity of yourself. Like they're literally, and then as they get a little bit older, you can kind of carve back out a, like, okay, here, here I am in the, you know, there is something that's independent of my children and my work. There is actually me in there as well, but it's crazy. It's hard. I think I, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, uh, we sent uh, my daughter to kindergarten, uh, like preschool yesterday for the first time. And then the two wow. hours that she was there, uh, great, actually. We had free time, me and my wife, to spend, uh, <laughs> like, to, to spend on our own. And then it was amazing. Uh, but it's, 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 I agree with you. It's, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, yeah. But uh, it needs, I mean, some, some time management. And, uh, and, of course, working with a great team is also another uh, another uh, benefit if you work with a team that has uh, i mean uh, that uh, they know what they're doing and then with they have their own expertise that helps you a lot to to manage uh, your, your board balance um, uh, and personal life uh, so human uh, do you have any questions or yeah i do have a question a very short question is an entrepreneur born or made <laughs> And you know, it's funny because like I said, I was, this was not my plan, right? I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't, and I don't know whether that's, it, it's like a really, a, I mean, my parents weren't entrepreneurs. And so it wasn't really a conversation we had, you know, like it, it wasn't something that I was thinking about when I was younger. And then it, and I did kind of fall, I mean, it, I fell into it, but I will say that I, I actually, I, I love it. I love that aspect, like the, the building the company aspect and the um, and being, you know, that I am I'm in charge of the science and you know the buck stops with me for everything scientific at Eupraxia, but I'm also, you know, talking to our CEO daily about the financing and you know and how are we raising money and what's our strategy? Are we gonna do it this way? Are we gonna do it that way? And and growing you know, hiring people and thinking about company culture and you know, values and all of these things, which I guess it, when you're running an academic lab, you have to be thinking about those things as well. But that, and, and I do think that there actually is a, that academia is more entrepreneurial than you actually think about because in a way you also have to, I mean, you're also getting funding and you're also growing a company. I mean, it's a lab, but it is a, essentially, it is a company. Um, and and it really is very rewarding and, and very satisfying to have the sense of um, to, to, to be, in, you know, like if I was working at Pfizer, I would, you know, have a very small slice of what I was, uh, you know, what I was getting to touch. And, and I, you wouldn't necessarily get to see all of the impacts of what you're doing or how your decisions are, are you know, making, you know, affecting other things. And, Anyway, it, it's been lovely. So I, I mean, I've only ever worked in small biotech, but but I can't really imagine doing something else at this point. So if I got it uh, correctly, your parents were uh, entrepreneurs, right? No, my dad no, was here, but and my mom was a. I mean, she did computer science, but she was okay. she was a. But no, they weren't. So it wasn't really part of the conversation. It, so I, I think that that, I, and I do like. Uh, 
I think now they are trying to expose kids earlier to the idea of being an entrepreneur, but it wasn't, I think had I thought about it earlier, maybe it would have come into my uh, like my conversation earlier in, in what I was thinking about what I, what I wanted to do. But but truly, I didn't even occur to me until kind of like after my PhD that it just would be even something that I could do. So, but I didn't answer your question. Are they born or made? I think it's, but I think it's both. You need to be able, like there need to be comfortable in risk because biotech is, you know, it's not a secure place. You know, like you never have five years of money in the bank. You have three months of money in the bank or two weeks of money in the bank or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and, but you, you know, with that risk comes the reward of actually being able to make the impact. That it is. So, so <clears throat> this is my, my question also, like, uh, did you ever uh, regret that not to become a professor now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I don't think so. Well, I mean, it was funny because we were laughing before the session started. We were talking about how I didn't, I get, I, one of the reasons I was like, ah, I don't want to be a professor. I don't want to write grants. And then you go out and, and you're in small biotech and all you're doing is, you know, writing grants. Uh, so, but I do, I think, no, I, I don't regret not being a professor. I, I like, I, I guess, it felt like, and maybe it's not the same, but it felt like you have less, like when you decide to be a professor, you go out and you're done, and like one company, or sorry, one university in all of the United States is hiring for your position that year. You're like, okay, I guess I'm going to Minnesota. Like, I didn't want to go to Minnesota, but that's where the job is. Uh, so I didn't like that aspect of it either. Um, anyway, I, I do, but one of the things that's really great about it is I still get to work with great professors uh, because I get to collaborate with them uh, on developing technology. So it doesn't really feel that much like they left. I still get to feel like I'm in the kind of dynamic environment, of, but without having to be a professor. That's great. Thank you so much. But I mean, the odd was uh, was uh, really high if you because you were graduated from Stanford, so it was not a problem to apply and get a job. But that was your own. You never know. Thing. You never know. So there is a question from Vahid here. Uh, uh, he asked uh, about the uh, I think your uh, EP one o four IAR. Yep. Uh, uh, he's asking if this this medication is efficient on the the patients uh, with uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis and osteoarthritis. Yeah, so we are developing it for osteoarthritis, um, yeah. but I think that it can. There's no reason it couldn't be used for rheumatoid arthritis. We picked the development pathway to get approval for osteoarthritis. We are looking. So there's a thing called the orphan indication so you can get expedited reviews um, for drugs if you're dealing with an orphan indication. So we might look at it as a treatment for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis because that is an orphan indication. The issue with rheumatoid arthritis is it's often like a very diffuse disease that affects many, many joints. We probably can dose to definitely two, maybe three joints, but if you had rheumatoid arthritis such that it was you know, in both your hands and your knees and your hips, it would be difficult for a local treatment to us to deliver that local treatment to all those different places and not get the systemic side effects of, of the steroids. So we do see it as a potential or like someone who had rheumatoid arthritis but had one or two particularly painful joints, you can you could treat those joints and then also potentially still have the systemic treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, that's great. Now, uh, yeah, Mohsen, please go ahead. I think you are muted. Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm asking too many questions. I'm very excited about your experience and expertise and then, uh, uh, and I wrote a, a couple of uh, questions here, but uh, I'll try to uh, to ask the most important ones for me at least. Uh, so so you have expertise from, from ideation. So you developed a platform technology 
then you try to use this platform technology for different applications. So you pick application that there has that has more demand and then uh, you go through the preclinical studies uh, for that particular application and then a uh, clinical studies of course is the next step uh, but my question is during this path when is the best time to start thinking about the clinical studies so at what stage you start thinking about it you form a team you start looking into uh, raising funding uh, because clinical studies is going to be very expensive uh, uh, yes. So when do you start? How early should you think about all of these? Yeah. So honestly, it's a it's an iterative process. So you, I think, when you're picking an indication to go for, I, that is a really good moment to look at your clinical studies because uh, you could do you could spend some time there and realize that what you're actually like the thing that you're doing is incredibly valuable and incredibly important, but you're actually looking at something that to actually show the effect such that you're proving it to people, you would need 30,000 people in a trial that's going to last 10 years. And you look at that and you say, oh shit, as a biotech, there is no way I'm gonna get the $300 million it's gonna take to run that trial. Like there, you know, we can't do that. And so that doesn't mean that you can't develop that product, but it, then it means you have to look at it and say, okay, there is no way that we are going to be able to fund those studies, but are there good animal models where you can show a proof of concept such that then you could convince somebody else to partner with us to do those studies? It just changes the math on what that you want to, you know, what you want to do. And so when Upraxia looks at what our pipeline is we try and do all of that at the beginning and then you you can you revisit it over time and so we're also trying to balance not only like what does one clinical program or what does one development program look like but then how do other development programs fit together such that you know okay our lead product is a six month product and so those studies are pretty long so maybe our next product can be something that like we want to treat someone for a week and, and have an impact. So then you can balance. And so those, you know, those animal studies and those clinical studies are shorter and you can then kind of match your, because you all, you know, it's like you want to have in the ideal world, m you know, money notwithstanding, you want to have, you know, this product in the clinic and this product about to go in the clinic and these, pro you know, and then so you've got one product in the clinic and three products about to go in the clinic and five products in preclinical and, and then, you know, 15 products that are you're just thinking about because everything you know you you get attrition as you go through and but so but and then like that when do you think about the money for that for like you know everything happens you know like you don't raise all the money at the beginning you know you raise enough money to get you to the part where you say okay there here's the value inflection that i can go and show people that i de risked at this for this much so like you know now is it you know and that's raised the value and now you can come in and this money is being used for the next step so so we have certainly raised money slowly over time to because you don't want i mean if the clinical study we're trying to run now costs 10 million US dollars to run. Like we're trying to raise $25 million right now. And you can't do that on pre, like if you do that on preclinical data alone, you know, you're, they own 80% or, you know, 90% of your company at that point. So it is all about getting just raising just enough money to get yourself to the next inflection point, but also knowing that everything's going to take longer and, you know, cost more than, than you think. So, but I do, but it is very important to, from the beginning, think about, okay, what does the full path look like? And then, you know, sketched out and then you, it fills in obviously more as, as you go. Great, great advice and a great answer. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, here, uh, one of our audience, Mehak, is uh, echoing your opinion about becoming an entrepreneur. She says that we don't want a slice. Here's come a need to be an entrepreneur. Learning for whole 16 years or more and then just getting a little isn't acceptable by everyone like me also. So I started something on my own. Okay, I think I understand 
your question. Um, so, I mean, here's the thing. Yes, as an entrepreneur, you do end up getting, like, when you start a company, I may not be asking this question, but I'm gonna give you some advice. When you start a company as an entrepreneur, you, you look at it and you say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna own this much of the company and you chart out like, okay, and it's gonna be worth a gajillion dollars. And so, and you do the math and you think you start dreaming about your Ferraris and whatever, because you look at it and you're like, this is like, there's no way this isn't gonna work. And then over time, you realize that you have to take way more dilution than you thought that you were gonna have to take to get to where you need to go. Because either you're like, you know, when people, come to invest in you, obviously they're gonna grind you on your valuation and things are gonna take, cost more money than you think. But the point being, you always are growing the pie. So, I mean, I think it's interesting because I, I feel like, you know, as we've, as Upraxia has grown and we've learned, there have been times when we didn't, for better or for worse, we didn't take money because we felt like, oh, we are worth more than that or oh, whatever it was and we, we turn that money away. But the point is you need to take, you need to get the money to grow, right? You, so, and if you, it's better to own less of a something that's worth a lot than to earn, own a bunch of something that is not worth anything because you didn't get any money and you couldn't go anywhere with it. So you will end, as an entrepreneur, by the end, you will probably end up owning way less of it than you thought, especially the first, I guess, once you've done it, if you've done it multiple times and you can be investing more of your own money, then maybe you can end up with more of the pie at the end. But if you, if you leave your PhD and you're as broke as most people are when they leave with their PhDs, you're, you will own a chunk of it at the end, but it's not going to be as big as you thought it was going to be. But it still is, you know, it, it will be a significant amount and it will like, you know, when if the product is successful, you will get a win and, you know, it will be great. Um, but you can't get too caught up in, I want to own, I want to be Mark Zuckerberg and own 50% of whatever it is that like, I think that that ends up actually being counterproductive of, you know, actually getting to where you want to be. Which I'm not actually sure answered your question, but excellent. no, no, that excellent. was great. Uh, that was my next question. The piece of advice from you to to the early career, uh, I mean, the graduate and also early career researcher, uh, to to that they want to become uh, an entrepreneur. So you uh, partially answered. But if you have uh, something to add, you can. Yeah. <sighs> A great piece of advice. Uh, the yeah. secret sauce for today? <laughs> um, I mean, I think if you have an idea that you're excited about, like, uh, it's, I think the, my advice is to go for it. I think it's, you know, like, it's so great. And I do think that, you know, even in, like, a lot of small biotech sale, that's just, so, you know, like, if you look at the nature of, of the beast that that is the, the probability equations that we're dealing with but that doesn't mean that you don't actually learn and grow and produce value um in the learning and the failure and the success right i mean even if eupraxia does not end up getting a product approved in the market helping people i have learned so much about the process of getting a drug developed and approved that that is is incredibly useful anyway right? so i think that it's scary to start a new company but it's also it's not actually as hard as we think in a lot of ways and i especially for those people prior to having children what else are you doing come on just you know um, like it it you know there when you have less uh demands on you your finances and everything but and you can take higher risks and not you know not need to help pull a big salary because you're not paying mortgage and you're not doing all those things it is a great time to you know roll the dice and, and you know be a little risky and i think that you know there's lots of rewards there for that great thank you so much uh this is also my i think most of this is the last question but if you have any question you can ask <laughs> 
I'm just puzzled. You're, yes, you are from Southern California, and then you graduated uh, from U.S. You met your husband there, and then you came to Canada. But I'm just wondering why Victoria, why you didn't move to Toronto, for example? <laughs> oh, I'm very West Coast biased, I think. Yeah. I'm sticking to the to the West Coast. I, well, my husband was from Vancouver, so oh, we okay. moved from so. We, you know, we met in Northern California, moved back to Southern California for a little bit, had my first, had our first kid there, and then moved to Vancouver in 2010 and lived there for five years. And then the CEO of Impraxia, who was in Vancouver, moved to Victoria. And so at, at that point, I could have decided to stay in Vancouver, but we were like, well, let's give it a try. Um, and so we moved to Victoria five years ago. It's a nice city. I have uh, I have been there, and most of them was uh, hosting it's, it's, me, and it's, it's great. Let me just add to Amanda's uh, uh, comments as well. It's uh, I mean, uh, East Coast is colder. That's one thing. Uh, and then compared to Vancouver, we have less rainy days, so we have more sunny days. Uh, it's true. We have twice the, twice as much sun and half as much rain as Vancouver, exactly. and houses are more affordable. So my husband, who grew up in Vancouver, says that Victoria feels like Vancouver 30 years ago. It has the like kind of the smaller, smaller city vibe. I've been very happy. It's been great. Actually, I got my Canadian citizenship a year ago. So oh, yeah. congratulations! Yeah. <laughs> so amazing. yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, I don't know, Mohsen, Do you have anything to add, or Amanda? Do you have anything to add? I want to just. Uh, uh, announce uh, once again our next uh, speaker uh, for just uh, hold on a moment. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Amanda. Uh, it was uh, an amazing talk, very inspiring. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we read the comments from from the uh, participants, uh, and um, uh, we have received tremendous uh, support. And uh, and then uh, uh, of course. Uh, well, I would like to also thank Amanda for uh, for taking your time. Uh, I know you're very busy. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to give a talk here. Very inspiring. I learned a lot from you, and then I hope that uh, uh, others who participated in this uh, uh, talk and this series uh, are also there and enjoying your talk. I'm sure. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, many many will be, especially graduate students, will be inspired by your journey and your success story. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I also want to thank you uh, on my behalf uh, to take time and uh, answer the questions. And uh, we really learned. Uh, I, as an early uh, stage professor, I learned a lot. And hopefully, uh, I can implement those insights in my, my research and in my future companies. So uh, before I close the session, I would like to uh, encourage everybody to, to, to join us next uh, Wednesday, uh, same time, same place, uh, with Dr. Andrew Lee, uh, head of bioprinting and co-founder at Floyd Form, uh, who is uh, he's talking about fresh treated bioprinting for functional tissue engineering. So uh, I would like to, to, to invite you all to, to join us. And also, I would like to thank again the, our sponsors, Montreal Transmetic Institute and 4M Biotech. And uh, by that, uh, I will close the session. And have a great uh, day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.